It's an honor for me to be able to say a few words today about Bob Martin. Some of you have already met Bob in the early morning session, but many haven't. So I'd like to start at the beginning. Okay. Bob was born in New York, the son of the great sociologist Robert King Martin. And he grew up in a small suburban town just outside the city. Okay. There he had a quint quintessentially all-American childhood, playing varsity football and building and racing dragsters. Uh, two things that I always dreamed about doing, but never had the skill to accomplish. Okay. But one thing, however, uh, foreshadowed uh, his future career. According to Bob, in childhood games, he often pretended to be a banker. Okay. Bob went on to study engineering at Columbia, where his father taught for many years. And after graduating, he enrolled in the doctoral program uh, in applied math at Caltech. Fortunately for all of us, he soon decided that his heart was really in economics. Okay. So he, in 1967, uh, uh, moved to the economics department uh, doctoral program at MIT where he formed a close and fruitful tie with Paul Samuelson. Okay. Bob joined the finance faculty at MIT in 1970. Okay. Bob's years as a graduate student and a young faculty member were filled with remarkably brilliant insights. Okay. Uh, it's no exaggeration to say that during this time, uh, he revolutionized major parts of finance. Okay. Earlier, uh, Harry Warkowitz had uh, con shown how to construct optimal investment portfolios. And Bill Sharp had shown the equilibrium implications of Markowitz's work. Both won Nobel Prizes for their research. Okay. Bob was the first to realize, uh, but as important as their ideas were, they were set in a static and timeless setting. And Bob was the first to realize that those key results would be fundamentally different in a dynamic environment where op investment opportunities were constantly changing. Okay. And in two landmark papers, uh, he developed uh, a truly intertemporal uh, theory of portfolio selection and asset pricing. Okay. At the same time, Bob was doing foundational work on options and their applications to corporate securities. Okay. His work there formed the basis of countless subsequent academic articles. And, and for their work on options, he and Myron Scholes received the Nobel Prize in 1997. Okay. Uh, let me see. Bob uh, has had as great an impact on industry as he has on academia. The work that he, uh, Myron, and, and Fisher Black uh, did uh, on options can be applied to the valuation and hedging of almost any security. Okay. As such, their ideas formed the intellectual basis for the modern derivatives industry both on exchanges and, and over-the-counter markets. Okay. You know, furthermore, many non-financial companies now use option pricing methodology uh, to value the, um, uh, to judge the value of flexibility in their physical investment projects. In fact, every year, new applications for uh, develop for the contingent claims framework that Bob pioneered. Okay. Later, uh, Bob's research turned to financial innovation and the way that financial institutions change over time. And partly as a result of this new focus, Bob moved down the street to Harvard in 1988. There he was for many years a university professor, Harvard's highest honor. Okay. To our great joy, uh, this past summer, Bob finally decided to come back home to MIT. So now I'd like to introduce to you our newest faculty member and your keynote speaker, Bob Merton.
Well, thank you, John, for that very nice introduction. And this is quite a crowd. I, I can't remember when I last I was in Rockwell Cage, but I never imagined speaking here. Uh, well, uh, I, I hope that all of you were able to be in the morning sessions because some of what I was planning to talk about was very well covered, in fact, covered better than I could do, and that gives me a little more time for other things and you'll, you a little less time to have to listen to me or as a captive audience. Now, finance is important to all of us. A well-functioning financial system, including its legal and accounting components, is a key driver for realizing the long-term growth and development potential of an economy. This conclusion emerges from a variety of studies, including cross-country comparisons, firm-level studies, time series research, and econometric investigations using panel techniques. A number of economic historians have included that those regions, be they cities, states, or countries, that develop the relatively more sophisticated and well-functioning financial systems were the ones that were also the subsequent leaders in economic development of their times. Now, for nearly four decades, financial innovation has been a central force driving the global financial system towards greater efficiency with considerable economic benefit having accrued from those changes. The scientific breakthroughs in finance in this period both shaped and were shaped by the extraordinary innovation in finance practice that expanded opportunities for risk sharing, lowering transaction costs, and reducing information and agency costs. Today, no major financial institution in the world, and this includes all the central banks, can function without the computer-based mathematical models of modern financial science and the myriad of derivative contracts and markets used to extract price and risk discovery information, as well as to execute risk transfer transactions. But as I need hardly may say, the global financial crisis of 2008 to 2009, of a magnitude and scope not seen in nearly 80 years, which is at least some attribute to the cumulative changes in the financial system brought about by financial innovations, particularly those involving derivatives and mathematical models. Now, in determining the causes of the financial crisis, and we had that discussed yesterday and again touched on this morning, I actually believe that the pathological data necessary in the gathering is not complete. That doesn't mean we don't know pieces and parts, but even in today's newspaper, you saw the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission uh, was a major time story, and you may recall, if you saw it, what the conclusions were. They depended on who you read. This is after collecting the data. Just as a side, and please hear this in a sense of humor, not, not as criticism, but it is rather interesting as a sort of process to imagine that Dodd-Frank was passed last summer, uh, presumably as a result of the financial crisis, and the investigation to determine what caused the crisis was completed several months later after it was passed. Uh, something to think about. But in any case, I think there are many plausible hypotheses, but they are still hypotheses. What I'm pretty confident about, though, that when we do come to have a better understanding of the whole of the interactions, it will not be some single item, as we recall perhaps in the story with Feynman and the sad occurrence of the Challenger disaster, which by coincidence happened exactly 24 years ago today. Uh, in which you may recall when he dropped the O-ring into the ice glass, or you saw pictures of it, and when he took it out after all the discussion, snap, and that's what happened. Now we know there was a little few other things besides that, but it was very dramatic. I don't think we will find that here. But I'm not going to focus on the crisis because we heard so much about it. They're clear there were fools and knaves, but it should also be clear that there were many structural elements, elements that would have happened even if people were well-behaved and well-informed. And in looking to the future and how we can, if not avoid such crises, at least mitigate them or be prepared for them, 
it's important to know that it isn't just a matter of bad behavior or foolish behavior, but indeed we have embedded in our systems structural risks that are inherent, and in many cases ones there's very little we can do to mitigate, but only be prepared for. Now, uh, on the crisis, I, I have a couple little remarks, just, but there's, there's going to be no continuity to them, just bullet points, because I really don't want to stay on the crisis. But on some of the issues involving the crisis, uh, I think you'll see that in many cases it was old finance, not modern finance. I have in mind, for example, in the case of AIG, you are all aware, where AIG, unlike what I thought all the big firms were doing, did not have two-way mark-to-mark -mark collateral from the beginning of its positions, its derivative positions. So unlike a Lehman, which we know the disaster there, which did because it was lower rated, and I thought everyone did, so I, I just wasn't knowledgeable. I said, how can we be operating without it? But apparently it was seen to be okay to use the old-fashioned idea of a credit rating, a AAA rating guarantee, as a substitute for collateral. And as a consequence, really no controls on the magnitude of the positions. After all, if you don't have to post anything, uh, it's hard to, to control it. But it's important to remember that. Another one is efficient markets. Now, one doesn't have to believe in that religion completely to accept the principles which, from which it's derived. Namely, there's no free lunch. So in the case of Langston Banks of Germany buying AAA paper in U.S. real estate, who, which they were criticized ex post, I give them a pass because a AAA is supposed to mean that you don't have to know what's going on under the hood. But then I've got to give them a fail. For what? The yields on those AAAs were base financing rate plus 250 basis points, 2.5%. That is not consistent with the AAA number. Now, once in a while, like the $50 bill on the floor you find, a trade like that may come up. But if it's available every week in volume, something is inconsistent. And it's the lack of saying there is no free lunch, we've got to understand why, and if we don't understand why, stay away from it, that I think we'll also find was a part of the cause. Another item is plumbing. I was really surprised, I mean, I confess. I didn't realize how much it was that documentation and such would cause what's called complexity, because while many of the securities are called complex, as Stuart Myers said earlier this morning, compared to a regular firm, these structured uh, special SPV structures and so forth were not complicated. But they are complicated if you can't get the documentation. So one other last point, and then I'll move on to what I really want to talk about, and that is innovation itself. Someone said, and I can't recall who it was, maybe they were just having a joke, something about the only innovation they can remember having happened in recent times of any worth in finance was the ATM. Um, no point in debating it, but all I can think of is two or three that just come to mind. For one, household finance. If you look at what we taught, many of you were in the classes, we taught about holding well-diversified portfolios and keeping your costs low, and clearly the individual trading in individual stocks except for consumption purposes, or because they're forced to because they're entrepreneurs and they're intimately engaged in the business, is got to be suboptimal. And yet that's what individuals did almost exclusively at the beginning of this period that I talk about. Today, I think it's fair to say they may still be speculating or doing things that we might not think are totally optimal, but they're doing it better in the sense now they're using mutual funds or ETFs, or at least they have a diversified position. And many more people do get reasonably efficient exposures to the equity markets than they did in the 1950s or 60s. And I point that out. The second one is, of course, the national mortgage market. I'm old enough to actually live through some of the good old days, and I can tell you that every time Reg Q came in and you couldn't get money, that had a rather negative impact on housing. The idea that we have mortgages available, at least we used to, uh, I won't comment on the most recently, but is, is a manifestation of that. It created competition, and it was again mentioned this morning, 
it spread the risks of those mortgages around rather than leaving them in the local uh, holders. And then, of course, as close to life, there's many other examples, are the banks. What's the classic risk in a traditional simple bank? I say simple, it makes loans and takes deposits. It's always an interest rate mismatch. It creates huge interest rate risk. That interest rate risk does not add value to the bank's business. Anybody can speculate in interest rates, and if a bank has a real skill set for forecasting interest rates, it's wasting its time to do that with customers' deposits, as well as it should just do that as an asset management business and get better compensated. And so it's clear it's a risk, a big one, that banks in their traditional roles had to bear, and we don't even think about it anymore, have no need to bear, so that if they do so, they do it so at their own choice. Well, I won't go on. I want to talk about the future, looking future of uh, uh, finance. Uh, this title, I'll take responsibility for it, but it was a little bit short, shorter in my, I would, but think of it more as observations on the future of finance, and actually observation on the future of financial engineering, so we get it down to a, to a more tractable scale. Now, in looking to the future, the two, there are two areas. One is basic research, and there, actually, I'm not going to say very much. I may come back to it if I have time and you have willingness, because we have many venues to say this, and I was thinking on this occasion, it would be more appropriate to talk about the applied uses of finance in the future those that are lean on the, or you make use of all of what has been developed and taught here in other uh, universities, but which is the sort of what we would call the financial engineering. And then I was asking myself, well, how might I go about doing that? And I thought about it and I said, well, rather than talk about in generalities, I'm going to do a case study. But not the ordinary kind of case study. I saw a bunch of people about to leave the room. <laughs> including John Cox, who introduced me. Um, but don't you fear about that. This is a live case study. And what I'm going to do is take a problem, a global problem which is quite substantial, one that we have to address, and that whether or not the financial crisis is on the front page is not going away. And in fact, this is back on the front page. And ask ourselves the question, how do we go about attacking that problem and treat it as a financial engineering problem go through it with you, and see if in some exemplifying way this example shows why financial engineering and finance in general has an important future and why we don't have the option to go back to the 1930s. I have no objection, and I want to be clear about putting restrictions on what institutions can do and can't do, and if we want to switch to depo keep depository institutions from doing other activities, my uh, many time colleague, co author Svibodi, and I wrote about that probably 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, so that's not that. But going back to Glass Steagall literally doesn't make sense. It's no different than when you have the case of saying, let's put, get rid of Google, let's get rid of uh, Facebook. I saw Hal jump, and I said, don't worry. <laughs> I don't think there's much chance. But it's, it's the same thing. The world has changed, we can't go back. So let's talk about what we should do going forward. With that as an introduction, let me tell you about the problem. The problem is that of retirement. And I'm going to make it more focused in dealing with the retirement part of the life cycle to tell you that if you think about retirement, the way it's normally talked about over in Europe, it's referred to the three pillars. Here in the States, it's more folksy. It's called the three-legged stool. But basically, every way you look at it, the three parts that make up financing retirement are government, in our case, Social Security, employer-provided pension plans, and personal saving. In the last 10 years, particularly, the leg of the stool that has been most in shock and is the biggest change coming forward is the employer plans. And it began, I believe, at the beginning in 2000 to 2002, where you had world stock markets decline substantially. At the same time, interest rates declined substantially. And as a consequence, defined benefit plans, the mainstream of pension, in which the benefits are uh, provided to pensioners are fixed in advance, and the issuer, in this case, the company guarantees it. Uh, as a result, the falling interest rate made liabilities rise, falling stock markets assets fall, and some of the weakest uh, companies in industries such as steels and 
airlines actually went bankrupt as a consequence. But more to the point, it became pretty clear how risky and expensive these plans were. And I, in my own view, the watershed was January 2006, when IBM, known to be an employee-centric company, highly profitable, and with an overfunded plan, nevertheless capped its defined benefit plan for existing employees. No more. And after that, many other companies followed. So this created a challenge because employers are not getting out of the role of providing benefits. So what do they do to replace this? Now this is the challenge, but it's also the opportunity. Every such challenge has that. The natural candidate, and many of you I know have these plans, you all must be aware of them by now, are defined contribution plans. By their very name, you know what you put in, but you don't know what you're getting out. It depends on what investment experience you have. By going to those plans, it solves sponsors' problems of unbounded or, or hard to estimate exposures and cost, but in the process, has made things extremely complicated for all of us, all the people who need retirement. It is a much more complicated system. It adds individuals, you and I, to make decisions we've never had to make in the past, don't know how to do now, and won't be able to do even with education going forward. We have to solve a very complex optimization problem that John was alluding to. What is it? We get contributions coming in, typically as a percentage of our salary while we work, and what has to come out at the other end? A pension, a pension adequate for us to live in a style that we would like to and expect to be able to do. And that's over many years with lots of uncertainty. The idea of asking each individual to be responsible for that analysis, decision, and implementation isn't remotely close to optimal. So what could one do uh, as an alternative? So I want to take you through at least one pass of this, and I hope in the process exemplify all the different parts of financial engineering and why we need this. So if you're going to start out with a new pension plan, you're going to design it, and you go back to scratch, what's the first thing you're going to need? Before you can optimize, before you can design, what do you need? A goal. What's the goal? You got to decide out where you want to go before you start going. So, if you have to come up a goal, and remember, this is for very specifically, this is not probably for most of you, thank goodness, but this is most, for most people, do not have financial advisors, do not have a lot of extra money. They're doing fine, working. I'm not talking about people who don't have jobs. But this is for people who don't have advisors and don't have the luxury of having themselves psychoanalyzed periodically to find out what they want. So you have to come up with a goal that fits most people most of the time. And the one we, it seemed sensible to me anyway, was to say that people would like to sustain the standard of living and retirement that they enjoyed in the latter part of their work life. You know, you're a young group, but when you get there, you've gotten pretty used to how you're living. And you wouldn't mind living better, but you sure don't want to live that worse. And so that was the starting goal. You say, okay, standard of living, how do we define that in some way that we could actually execute? Now, this isn't about your, how you feel philosophically or emotionally. I can't do anything about this. We mean your economic standard of living. But how do you define that? Well, it's a common sense thing. You need to come up with uh, some measures. And first, I'd say that we broke it down into three areas. One is medis medical, housing, and then general consumption. You could have 20 categories, but those three seem to balance between complexity and difficulty and getting the essence of the point. I'm only going to talk about general consumption. Now, how do you define what you need in, in retirement? Well, here I'll call on Jane Austen to help us out. Has anyone read Jane Austen? Yes, I see uh, there's someone out there. He can check the quote, you know, maybe it's so long. Well, as you may recall, when she was writing about English knife, she didn't write about the big things in the sense of what governments are doing. She was interested in people, and particularly she often wrote about men and whether they were appropriate for her or her uh, friends. And so when she was evaluating, let's say, Mr. Darcy, she didn't say he was worth 100,000. She said 
He's worth 5,000 a year. And I think if you start to talk about our standard of living, how do we think about that? Is it a certain amount of money? No. It's a flow per year. We have a standard of living. You say, I can live at this standard of living if my income is us or the sources I have. So here's the goal we came up with. The goal was for general consumption in retirement that what people would like to have is a stream of income in retirement protected for inflation, so it's really dealing with, life, with standard of living, not hiding, you know, deteriorating uh, standard of living. For life, so you don't have to worry how long. If you live like the good books say, to 120, great. And if you don't, you don't need it. So for life, level protected for inflation. So that's the goal. How much you need, well, that's part of the process. You need, the typical way to do that is you estimate based on what people are making in the latter part of their work life, that their standard of living, if they've been living on that, will be roughly dictated by that. So it's an it's a, uh, object. So we look for what is called the replacement ratio. What fraction of my earnings the latter part of my work life would I need to sustain the standard of living that I'm enjoying at that time? It may be very high, not so high, or lower, but whatever it is, what will I need? And that became the target. So it's a little more complex. It's not a certain amount of money, not just a certain amount of money or uh, income for retirement, but an income as a function of how much you've been earning in the latter part of your work life. Okay? So that's the goal. Now, before we do anything else, let me, I'm now going to, for a, those of you who are in my class, remember I always used hard copy? Nothing's changed. I'm, so there's at least a 50-50 chance I'll push it the wrong way. Ah, I did get it right. Now, whether I get it right, the rest, I don't know. But here's what we did. So the first thing you do is you set up for target income. I wrote this down. All right? Now, if we have this target income, all right, then... First of all, what do we, what do, how do we get there? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a complex problem, how to get there. But whatever we do, we're trying to get to this level of, of income. Is my voice changing as I walk around? Yeah, okay, so we better stand here, huh? All right, is this better? All right, so what we have is a, you have a target way. So what you might think of is the first thing you could tell people is, here's the level of income really is a replacement level, we don't tell them that, but just here's a level of income that you should desire for this goal, okay? And then we tell them another thing, and I'll tell you why in a minute. We tell them what a minimum risk level of income is for that period, and that's another target. What's minimum risk mean? It means not guaranteed, but it means a level of income that you do everything you know how to do with all the technology you have and the focus of investment to get you that amount of income. So it's what you might call the safest you can do within what's feasible. All right, so you have desire, minimum. Okay? Now, suppose I tell you next, I'm going to tell you, given some other conditions, what your chances are of making that desired. All right, so you could think of it, here we are at MIT as a probability, right? Well, what if, let's say it says, 60% chance. If you think of that as a test score, how, do you, how would you like that on your test? Maybe not so good. It's kind of a D minus. Now, actually, in the UK, they say that's pretty good. So it's a, there are cultural differences. But I think, say, in Holland or here in the US, people would think of a 60% chance of getting there is not exactly what they had in mind. So what can they do about that? Well, if you want to improve your chances of getting there, I can think of only three ways. Now, I'm going to look over there at Ben and others and how we're sitting at the table. If you have a fourth way, well, I'll give you a fourth way, but it's not a real one. But if you have a fourth way, we have this on tape. You'll get full credit for it because you'll help the world. But the only three ways I can think of to improve your chances of getting to the goal are save more, work longer, or take more risk. Someone said, be lucky. Well, yeah, that's the fourth one, but I don't know how to do that. So if those are the three things, then what we want to do is say, give people choices. 
So this isn't like it, but only meaningful choices. I'm trying to contrast. I assume most of you know what a typical DC plan is. You get this thing that shows you a risk-return frontier, a bunch of funds you can buy, show where you can, you know, how much money you'll, a distribution of how much you'll accumulate when you retire in wealth, and a whole bunch of other things. And often we'll ask you questions about your risk preferences. Do you prefer this gamble or that? And frequently they'll also ask you, you know, it's eventually how much mid-cap uh, uh, equities in Europe you want to hold in your portfolio. There's a lot of discussion of asset allocation. Um, so I'm, keep that in mind. I'm not going to go through it because I know most all of you have seen it in some fashion. Uh, and so here's the thing. We have desire, minimum risk. And the only three ways we can improve that, you've agreed, or at least you didn't shout some fourth one, are either by saving more, working longer, or taking more risks. So what else do we add? We add it on this same little one screen. How much are you saving now? This is contributions. Okay. When do you plan to retire? So four items, one screen, nothing else. And the little scorecard tells you what your chances are. Now, suppose you want to improve your score. What could you do? You could increase the amount you save. So you move a little slider, and up it goes. I'm just giving this as an example. You, you understand there's no one optimum, but I've got, I'm using an example to show you how you think and how you put it together. And you move it up, and guess what happens? The score goes up. After a while, you get used to it. You move it a little bit, the score moves, and you get an idea of how those two things work together. So like driving a car. When you first learned to drive, you didn't know how much to turn the wheel or how hard to hit the brake or in the days of the clutch, how much to lay it out. But eventually you learned, even without high school education, right? You play around with it, all right? So you, you put it up a little bit, it gets a little better, so maybe your 60 gets to 67 or 68, and you say, hmm, well, what if I worked a little longer? Because I, I can't save any more right now. So you put it up a couple of years, and the thing goes, wing, it goes way up again. And you say, okay. Yeah, and then you say, no, I don't want to work that long. You put it back down. So now you still want to get it higher. What else can you do? What was the third thing I mentioned to you? Take more risk. So how can you do that? Remember that minimum risk? You lower it. Now, people can relate to that. Because they say, I'm trying to get this much. I have a very, very good chance of getting this much. And if I lower that, I'm taking more risk. What do you think happens? When you're willing to do that, you get a better chance of getting where you're going. Now, what's the point of all this? This is not, I mean, you're saying, why am I taking you through this? Because let's go back to the principles. I mean, if you agree with all the steps, I've taken you through all these three things. These are ways for people to make choices that are meaningful. Why are they meaningful? Because if you put that slider up and you push the right button twice, your paycheck is smaller next month. You, have, you know, that's not a hypothetical. And if the thought of working another two years doesn't, you know, get you thrilled, then, you know, that's a trade-off as well. And, of course, taking more risk. That's it. That's the design. That's the front end. Doesn't get much simpler. So it gives people a way to react. And you could think of it as like a doctor's, you know, when you go in for your annual checkup. Now, you know, I go in for mine, I'm sure many of you, I'm hoping my doctor will say to me, wow, you're, you're, all your numbers are great. In fact, if we didn't know better, we'd think you were 10 years younger. That's what I want to hear. But suppose that's not true. I mean, he, my doctor could still tell me that, right? But then what's the point of going for the checkup? So even though I want to hear that, I really want to hear if there's something wrong. So if they say to me, well, Mr. Merton, your, your cholesterol is 300, um, that's not good. Um, but what they then tell you is something you can do about it. You can exercise. You can change your diet, you can take statins, Lipitor, and so forth. So they tell you you have a problem, but then they tell you what you can do about it. It's exactly the same thing here. If you don't like what your retirement looks like, here are choices that you can make. And if you don't, you don't. But that's, you know, I purposely mean, that's the end of all this design as far as the user sees it. It doesn't get any simpler. Anyone who's going on all these websites and they've got, diagrams and everything, I mean, that's fine if you want to do it. It strikes me very much like an automobile, you know, when you're buying a car. You care about gasoline mileage, you care about zero to 60 speed, comfort. So someone says, you know, I'm selling my car, I've got a 9.0 to 1 compression ratio. 
And Myron's selling the car in competition, and he says, mine's got 9.4 to 1 compression ratio. Now, you're smart people. You know that it must be better to have a higher compression ratio. But how many people in the room, we're at MIT, remember, not in a random place, how many people in the room can tell me by increasing the compression ratio by 4 tenths from 9 to 9.4, how much more gas mileage I will get, and how much faster my car will go 0 to 60? I suspect they're not many. And that's what investing in a lot of the advice that you get when you, if you've ever think about it, and this is what we're asking not just MIT people and people who enjoy doing this, where this is the, the, the direction we're going is the solution for retirement, not just here in the States, not just in the Anglo-Saxon UK in the States, but in the continent and other places. Everywhere is going for it. Why is this a problem? Another problem, I'll tell you where else it's coming from. We're back in the newspapers. Has anybody been to notice anything on municipal pensions? Has anyone seen that in the paper? Now, some reasonably uh, sensitive people have estimated the underfunding uh, for municipalities and states at $3 trillion. Now, I know, we all get used to trillion here, trillion there. $3 trillion is a lot of money. And we're going to have to solve it. I don't know. I look at Jim Paterba. I assume he's going to advise the government as to how we're going to fix this, at least get them to $3 trillion. But after it's fixed, my guess is we're not going to have a big appetite for going back to DB plans for municipal employees. You know, that would be suicide, right? I mean, you, you just three trillion, you know, that makes the SNL crisis look like, you know, nothing. So this means probably we're going to have to deal with all those employees and those systems as well. And the question is, do we just go into it as using historical method or do we actually try to solve the problem in a sensible way. Now, I went back to first principles. Now, let me show you one of the problems with this. First of all, with this simplicity, how do you solve this complex problem? Well, the complexity is all under the hood, just like your car. You get in your car, you push that button, or if you have it, whatever, and you drive it. But what's going on underneath is very complex. And what's the difference here from what the traditional DC does, which is to tell you to make all these complex decisions, is all the complexities put under the hood to make it easy for the user. Paradoxically, that creates the paradox that makes it much more complex for the producer. Anybody can give advice. You go past series 70X, YZ exams, you can give advice from your garage. It's quite another thing to deliver a totally finished solution, a car, uh, where it's simple to use or complex for the user. And all of what's going on with that probability that they see is there's a huge amount of dynamic optimization going on because what we're really giving them is the frontier. We're optimizing given the kitchens the best we know how to do it. That doesn't mean someone else can't do it better, but you understand that that's all taken care of. When I say we, it's the hypothetical we, you know, whoever's doing this, solving this problem. And the point here is simplicity. The point is that to do this, it's very complicated, and in particular, what is the, one of the problems that I want to show you how big a change this simple is, is with the next slide. First, well, I've listed a, a few things of which um, you would want to have in the rest design. It has to be an integrated solution, which means it uses your Social Security, all of the other sources of retirement, because it doesn't make any good to optimize on one thing. It has to be robust, which means that the individual may never make a choice. It has to still work. All right, and that's a design criterion, which is pretty tricky because you have to make something where you're deciding for people who won't even answer an email. They won't even tell you, you know, they barely tell you your gender, their gender. It has to communicate clearly, as I met with the medical example, the meaning of choices, but it also has to fit the constraint. That's why I did it, we did it as a DC, that the sponsor has to have limited risk, okay? But now let me show you what the problem is. First problem. You all agreed with me that the goal was income for life. Have I lost you? All right. You all agreed with me that loss is income for life. I feel so constrained here, but that's okay. I'll stop sooner. Um, the, the, and so, suppose you had a 45-year-old who was retiring at 65, and morally dictated to that person has so much money accumulated already, that they actually could buy what they wanted for retirement now and take no risk. Now that's just for illustrative purposes. I don't think we find too many of those, but if you did. What would they buy? What's the risk-free asset is what we would say in our parlance. 
It's a life annuity, a stream of income at the right level, beginning 20 years from now and paying that person for life. So it's a fixed income instrument, has longevity in it because it's for life, but it doesn't even start paying for 20 years. Do you realize that's, that's the safe thing? You buy that, no matter what happens, you've got it as long as it's the right issue. Now let me show you what the current rules and regulations and what people are used to seeing. All of you, you have mutual fund accounts, whether they're retirement or not, don't you get your NAV or net asset value and how it's changed, or maybe you even look it up, but they very conveniently make it for you. What I've done on this screen is create first a security, which we call an annuity unit. All it is is a security that I just described. It starts paying in 20 years, it's, it's inflation protected, and it's a level payment for the, for the uh, appropriate lifetime. Okay, everybody understand what that, it's like a bond. Now, on the left, that's the monthly returns you would have gotten from 2003 to 2010, watching the monthly returns. Remember, you have no financial advisor. You open your account, and what do you see as a user? You've been told this is a risk-free asset. What does that picture look like? Does that look risk-free to you? This is the value of your portfolio every month. I think it looks, doesn't look at all that way. The problem is, that the information is being conveyed in the wrong units. It's conveying it in current dollars or euros. What it really wants to convey it in is the thing that matters to you, which is annuity units. Well, what does an annuity unit look like as priced in terms of an annuity unit? One annuity unit exchanges always for one annuity unit. So do you see, if you put it in the right units, you get the graph of the right side, which is the common sense. This is equivalent to a currency change. The way some of you may help you is, is it's like you had, you were investing for someone in dollars here in the state, Gene, your company is investing for someone, but they happen to be Japanese investors who care about yen. And so you, if you, would you give them dollar returns so they know what they're, how they did with what matters? No, you have to convert it. Well, we're converting it to units that matter to people. So I show you this to see how different the information is. Now let me show you one other familiar asset. U.S. 30-day Treasury bills. On the left, you see for those seven years hardly any variation. The principal amount's always protected and in very little variation. Safe. Isn't that how we always think of a Treasury bill? Safe. But in terms of the goal, the thing that you all, at least with your faces, even if you didn't physically look, agreed with me was that the goal, you see the risk it is? It's an incredibly risky asset. So but what I want you to see is this is a first-order effect. This is not round-off. This is about the idea if you use the wrong units to measure and communicate. First, you have to communicate with people, so it's very hard for people to understand. Secondly, if you're managing this, we talk about risk. If you're measuring the risk incorrectly, how can you possibly manage it correctly? And now I'll use this to show you one more step. If you create, for those who know, a risk-return frontier, you know, expected return versus volatility. I plotted the three on the left for the usual way, and you can see annuity units are almost as risky as common stocks, that's what MSCI is, all right? And T-bills are not at low risk. Now look at it in the proper units. Annuities are risk-free by construction. T-bills are very risky, and stocks are sort of in the same, same qualitatively the same place. So the point being that the risk return frontier is wrong, and that's the bad news. If you really are serious about solving the problem, then if we do it by our traditional techniques, we're very far removed. Now, how could we have done this? We could have used one of model that I did some years ago, in which you have, I have trouble with my fingers. See, these are two dimensions, three dimensions. If we go to four, I'm out of it. So, you could have had it as the traditional frontier dollars of return versus volatility in dollars and then interest rate risk. But of course the risk here that's going on is both real interest rates, inflation and longevity, all of which are not small risks, particularly real rates. And so what happens is that uh, this way allows you to do what? It allows you to represent things exactly in the kind of frontier that people are used to using. By, using, by making this transformation. And that's important in the practical engineering solution. Why? Because there's a multi, I don't know how many billion industry of pension consultants, portfolio managers, 
and others who have model after model after model of this type. If you go to them and say, we want to change the way we do things, by the way, everybody's going to have to scrap their models, I don't think you're probably going to get much of an uptake. And so it's this kind of thing. I know you say, why am I going through? I'm trying to show you by example all the things you have to deal with. Now let me give you another problem here. Let's go back to the slide just for a second. Remember this was the risk-free asset? Regulators are talking about, in some cases I've already put in, to make people safer, they'll put in a principal floor or a minimum guaranteed return. But what do they measure it for? They measure it with respect to value. All right? Look at the left side. That's a value measure. I can't put this person in the risk-free asset because if I do, I'm very likely to violate the regulation. What? Oh, next slide. No, no, I mean, the T-bills. Okay, well, the T-bills are safe. Yeah, that's, the, yes. But that's what I'm saying. I was wanting you to see the annuity one was going like this, and if we put a line there, it would violate the principle. That's why I showed the first one. So I'm just quickly saying, one, this is an order one effect. Two, there are ways to deal with it in the real world without causing the industry completely to change. So it's feasible to do this sort of thing. And three, all the regulations that are right now being written in the Department of Labor, in the European Commission, in the various other uh, entities, people are putting up ideas that sound very sensible. Let's put a minimum return in. Let's put a a principal guarantee, and all sounds very good, but if they're not understood what they're doing in terms of the real objectives, they could actually keep it from doing the right thing. And so that's, that's a, uh, the, the, the essence of this, this piece. The last part I'll show you about this to change the engineering. Again, not because it's better, it's better for, we think, the goal. What we've done is I've showed you with a kind of a bell-shaped curve, don't take it literally, that's the typical generic portfolio end of period value kind of thing where they say we'll get you with 95% or 90% or more. And if you look at the blue line, you see what we've done in optimization is focus on the goal. And so we maximize the chances of the goal subject to a risk constraints. And so what are we doing? We've transformed the distribution so that the right side tail that you get in a traditional DC you don't get, but you also don't get the left tail, but you use that right tail to improve your chances of getting the goal. So it's, I'm not saying one's better than the other, it depends on the right tool for the right job. The point is that when you truly optimize and don't just do things, you know, was, you can significantly improve the chances of success. And what we need to do for this group of people, for all of us, for the millions of people, they don't have extra money. We gotta get the most out of their assets. We've gotta deliver a simple, easy to use, and if they don't use it, still gets them their solution which gets the most for what they can do. These are, you know, the technical problems in this are, you know, they're not, they're the things that we heard talked about this morning. You have to have dynamic strategies that are optimizations. You use all the tools that you're legally allowed to use to implement this. You have to be very, very careful because, you, you know, that, that these things really do work. And there's a lot to, to design. But I wanted to just show you this as a way of taking you through and saying, Here's a big problem that's not going away. It's here. And maybe you believe, there are people out there who believe that you can solve this problem well using a simple bond market, bank loans, and a simple equity market, and get rid of all the complexity and go back to 1950 or 30 or 60 or 80, okay? But you'll be throwing away an awful lot of what you can do because the market-proven technologies that people have developed and used, and firms represented tables here and over here, uh, can be applied here to do a much better job for people. And if you think of the importance of this, I think that this is just one example, and one that's very important to me, so I, I share it with you, but it's only one of an example of why the idea of not using all the financial technology we can put together all the optimization, taking advantage of computations. And by the way, if you may not have realized it, but this has a lot of behavioral finance in it. Because the way that thing was designed to get people what they look at and what they don't look at was precisely so that they can understand it and use it. So they're really using all the disciplines, the modern disciplines of finance, 
to try to come up with the best solution. And I guess I've run now gone past your lunch and, and mine. I, I want to thank you for listening to me. I, I, I want to say that um, it's been a wonderful time in this field, and I'm really happy to be back here at MIT. And I want to thank you all for coming to lunch. I know it was a lunch, but, but you did pay for it, I think. And uh, maybe you didn't. I don't know. But, but in any case, thank you all, and I'll take questions if you're on. I don't want to give up more money, and I don't want to give up time. I'll just turn risk to the absolute top. Well, that's a very good, did everybody hear the question? The question was, what if people don't want to save anymore, don't want to work any longer, and want to put risk to the top? Of course, we could legislate what we allow to do. First of all, there's limits to how, what calling risk to the top is, uh, because there are only so many things you're permitted to do anyway. So it's, it's not an unbounded risk. You can't leverage, for example, in these accounts. But the, the answer is you've got to decide. If you're going to have plans where people have choice, then you can tell them, but they, in the end, it's their choice. They're getting feedback. They understand what they're doing. They're adults. If you don't like that, you can go back. But what has not, is not an answer to go back to a DB plan, where you designate everything because they won't work. So the answer is, if people will not save more, it's a little bit, what do you do about the person with 300 cholesterol if they won't exercise, they won't change their diet, and they won't take statins? Eventually, if you tell them everything and you keep reminding them, that's all you can do under this structure until you can force people to do what they do. You know. Okay. Is, is your analysis the same? Uh, case one, 5% of the American population adopts the plan. Case two, 100 percent of the American population adopts the plan. Um, I think the analysis is the same. Well, maybe you could clarify your question. Obviously, you have something in mind. Well, I was concerned about everybody investing in a particular, you know, like, say, asset classes or... No, any... any I purposely... You, you, yes, th thank you for your question, because okay. now you give me a chance to, to emphasize the point. The point is there are all kinds of asset classes underneath. But the people making decisions by that are the professionals who are doing the optimization. You're not sending people 20 or 100 page prospectuses or sending them things and letting them try to figure it out. So you can use any asset classes you want and everybody's not doing the same thing because they have different dates, everybody has a different place, everybody has different social security position, everybody has different incomes, everybody has different other resources. So the answer is, this is, as, as you saw on the design scale, it had to be scalable. So if it's not scalable, that's a design failure. And so the answer is, if it's designed right, it is scalable. In principle, everybody could use it. Thanks for a really interesting talk. Some of the mutual fund companies and money management companies that handle uh, 401ks and other um, pension funds for companies are beginning to offer target retirement funds. I wonder if you've looked at any of these products and have a sense of whether they begin to do what you've described as uh, okay. useful. That's a good question, um, and you know, I'll give you my judgment. And of course, like many things, the term target date fund or life cycle fund has, is morphing because there's a lot of innovation going on. But the traditional ones, the ones that most of you, if you've seen them, seen, were ones that said 2040. And if it's 2040, it gives you a schedule for the next 30 years of the mix between stocks and bonds, getting more and more into bonds to that date. And it's a mechanical rule. And when you're in it, that's it. Now, um, first of all, my belief is and I have to say this, but I feel pretty comfortable, that the origins of this strategy came from the industry's solution of a problem. They had to come up with some kind of strategy, but at the time, anyway, uh, they didn't want to take the kind of fiduciary responsibility that an advisor was. So they got a ruling that if they put a mechanical rule in age, 
then they wouldn't be responsible in the same level. And so all I will say, I have not seen anything that proves those those types of funds have any real optimality to them. Secondly, as you already saw from my demonstration, the tar they don't do their targets in terms of actual income. They do it in, for life. They do it in terms of the massive wealth. So they're using the wrong risk measures. Third, because they're not integrated, they don't take account of the other assets that people have, and so you have a completely distorted view. A 30-year-old, probably the biggest asset for retirement is future contributions. So if you put 100% of their accumulation in equities, it's only a small fraction of their total wealth. Someone in a different, all they ask you is your age. And finally, because this represents core retirement, not supplemental, you know, the stuff for people who want extra money, and therefore if you lose it, it's extra money anyway. But for the real stuff, for, for, for core retirement, these are probably the second most set of important decisions that people make after their health. How would you like to get your medical advice by going on the internet, putting in your age but not your gender, and getting your meds? And for the next 30 years. I mean, go back 30 years, 1980. There's some people in the room obviously who aren't even 30, but those of you who are around and can remember, has anything changed since 1980? Would you be comfortable setting the rules for what you're going to invest in something serious for the next 30 years? That just doesn't strike me as it. Now, as I say, what's called that's morphing into other things, thank goodness, but literally those things are, are I, guess, I don't see how you could believe that you could solve such a complex problem by just a single statistic, which is age. So somebody ought to be saying that publicly, I guess, because there's a lot of it going on. Well, right? I believe this is on a webcast, <laughs> I don't know. So there's at least six other people that are, uh, well, yeah, yes, sir. Um, you commented earlier, Bob, about the um, Congress's uh, ready, fire, aim approach to uh, legislating ahead of the uh, problem being solved. I wonder if you could talk to us a few minutes about how MIT and the finance group at Sloan might, over some period of time, have a, a positive impact. Uh, Thank you. By the way, uh, no one from the Sloan School put, asked you to ask that question, did they? Oh, okay. I still want you to think we had a show in the audience. No, I'm glad you did because that is something I wanted to touch on. One of the reasons, personally, that I came back to MIT because I was a free writer when I wasn't at MIT. I still got to see all the good people because I live in the neighborhood and they were nice people and they'll see me. But one of the reasons I came back was I was very excited about uh, the thrust that the MIT finance group and the school has done in the direction of teaching, creating the MFIN program, the master's in, uh, in uh, fin financial track, uh, because I think one of the important solutions we have, and it was mentioned earlier today a couple of times, is we need to get many, many more people trained well to address these problems. They're not going to get simpler. They're not going away. And the answer is not to have people who don't know what they're doing and somehow, even if they're well-meaning, even if they're totally ethical, and even if they are totally honest, if they don't have the skill set, like the wrong measure of risk, they can cause a lot of problems. They're not going to solve it. MIT is, seen, is committed to producing many more well, very, very well-trained MIT quality people to go there. Not just the most senior level, we want people to go in and as troops at the beginning where they can get experience, but they bring real skill sets. And this doesn't just apply to the private sector. Some of, as you certainly know, all the legislation and everything that's going on has gone in the direction of putting even more tasks in this domain on regulators, the Fed, SEC, et cetera, et cetera. And they need people who are very well trained, not just as the senior person who comes in in charge, but to execute what needs to be done. MIT can do a great job of training such people who can work both in the public and the private sector and globally. And that's where we're going, and that's one of the, you know, the exciting things about, that we have going forward. Obviously, the research side is another. And the third one, which I don't know, I put somewhere in between, but it's the kind of thing that, uh, that uh, Andrew Lowe has, has done a lot about, you know, with this idea of, uh, well, what's now read recognized as the Office of Financial Research. That may be one of the more important things to come out of Dodd-Frank. 
which will be an entity that has the right to collect enormous amounts of information from the financial community. Some of the very things that we're all talking about you would need in order to be able to try to anticipate either crowded trades, systemic risks, whatever. What are the data that we can get? It has very strong powers, at least it appears to, but if it doesn't have the abilities to be able to determine what data it can get while maintaining security and analyze the data and do things with it, it won't come to a hell of beans. And so I believe that there's going to be a much greater need. MIT can take the role on the education side, the research side, and if you call the OFR computational side. And I also would add that this is a great place for collaborative work. People who have worked in complex systems, people who have worked on these areas, all those skill sets um, are, are mostly needed and needed much more than they ever will be as a consequence. I feel uh, a word for the regulators. I feel kind of sorry for them sometimes. I think whenever we get a really hard problem, what we do is we write into the bill, the regulators will fix it, is if they were a plug factor that always made everything balance. And, you know, that takes resources, and in some cases, the tasks that are being asked are far beyond what are capable of doing. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you very much for this talk. Um, I happen to be with T.I. Kraft, mm -hmm. and I'm interested to get your insights on whether you think um, this evolution will come from the advisory community from the regulators or from the fund providers themselves? Good question. I, I think it'll come from all, but I think, I think as usual, people who are entrepreneurial or looking at a job will say, here's an opportunity. And like everything else, if they do a good job developing and they get people to adapt it, it'll work. And if they don't, it won't. Uh, so I, I suspect people will do this you know, maybe your own, maybe TIA Kraft does this, but I mean, you know, people will do this on their own. I will say I believe that regulators will, in my opinion, will generally view this, what I've talked to you about broadly, in a very favorable light because it makes sense, because it addresses the problem, and it's realistic. It doesn't promise by putting another 100 or 200 basis points that you can solve all the problems. It doesn't assume 8% risk-free rates it doesn't assume the very things that got us into so much trouble with the DB plans because they were built on another kind of scientific analysis, not that of the markets or finance. And so we, we had unrealistic expectations, uh, ones that were doomed to fail. And so I think if you put forward this sort of thing, that uh, need is a pretty big item and the regulators and countries facing this problem uh, see a pretty big need. And this is addressing a few of the issues that was brought up in the, have been brought up in the first question about, say, not working longer or saving more. So would it be, could it address that problem to any significant extent if such a plan were defined as in an opt-out scheme, which everyone is enrolled automatically, they would have to opt out of it themselves rather than having people opt into it. Would that perhaps result in higher... Well, I think that... This is exactly what I alluded to before. The question was, if you have an opt-out versus opt-in, if you don't know what that is, it, traditionally in defined contribution plans, when you join as a new employee, one of the forms you sign is, I join the DC plan. And often the company makes a match, meaning they, give you, they put as much or more than you would put in. So it's obviously for almost everyone a very good deal. But the history says that many people don't sign. We have someone from TIA Craft, they probably even could comment on that, but, but there's a lot of history that shows that people don't sign anything if they don't have to. It's kind of manana, I'll do it. Somewhere. So the idea came up, which was put into law in the 2006 Pension Protection Act, which allowed what's called an opt-out system, which is you have to sign to get out. If you don't sign anything, you're in the plan. So it's reversed it. The good news is people who didn't sign before to join don't sign to not join. So you get big enrollments increase, and that's the whole point of this now that it's becoming core, much more important, all right? What's the bad news? You're running this, this fund, the person becomes a new employee, you, you prepare their first paycheck, and you're taking this money out, right? First of all, how much money do you take out? They haven't told you. 
So you have to say something. And then what do you do with it? So the point of the matter is, is you have to have what's called a default. And a default is what happens if you're in the plan and you don't make any election. And that's determined by a combination of the sponsor, advisors, and obviously regulatory oversight. And uh, that's a very, very important thing. Now, the system I presented to you here generically has the feature that you saw that it's probably a pretty good one for default because it doesn't require the individual to make any asset allocations. It doesn't find to make any decisions, but it continuously optimizes to a goal. The problem is that the goal will be set for them, but that's better than, you know, it's like your doctor saying, I don't know anything, I'll set your goals 120 cholesterol. You know, maybe you don't, you know, but, but if you don't sign up, what are you going to do? Okay. Do. Thanks for the interesting presentation. Um, seems to make a lot of sense. I'm curious to know what you see as the leading obstacles uh, or play. Reject the hypothesis that of change. You can't expect that people say, oh, that's great, do it. All right, so, so you have to work hard to do that. You have a lot of problems with information. I already alluded to the regulatory ones. You have communications issues. You have people who are saying, please, not on my watch because I don't understand it. All of those things. Um, and maybe there is a better mousetrap. I mean, there, you know, I'm just saying it. But uh, I, don't, I, I don't see any real reason you can't do this. In other words, I really don't, it's not against public policy. In fact, I think it's perceived as pro-public policy. So it's not something where you're going to get intended resistance from the regulators. But the unintended ones are pretty brutal if you don't control it. Um, I, uh, I certainly share, share, I, I certainly share uh, your optimism that, that I think that this, you know, that the burdens are not as big. Um, where do you see as most likely the institutional home for the financial knowledge that is going to be needed to, um, to, uh, to drive it? And from my special vantage point there, I was sort of seeing two different models. I saw, I saw Ben and, the, and BlackRock as a traditional, uh, traditional but um, innovative um, financial uh, service firm. And then I saw Hal and uh, the idea that uh, uh, Google or some sort of um, open source uh, uh, home, home for the um, financial knowledge is, uh, I mean, the, uh, well, but I see those as, as, a, as a two separate paths, both of which could, could uh, try to do the implementation here. Well, that's a good, good question. I, um, Jim, good to see you. Yeah. See, you get good questions from former students who are good students. Yeah. I didn't plant him either. Um, no, I, I think it, we say information. I mean, there's an enormous amount of transaction knowledge and, and optimism, you know, finance knowledge you need to do this. You actually have to execute. This isn't an advice engine, and it's very clear. This is a solution. So this isn't something where you have a, you know, you have a set of software and people look at it and you say, this is what you ought to do, and then they look at it and they like it or not, and then they call up. So, so if, if someone else is going to do it, they're going to have to have the expertise to do the dynamics. Maybe I wasn't responding. I mean, you know, you certainly could have a joint venture or something of this. Uh, I mean, this is, this is sort of more um, wealth, this is sort of more of the um, wealth, Welcome back to MIT and the idea that you don't need the um, the that the innovation on, on on the financial side coming from inside a single shop, but instead um, the idea that as the system got more complex, it would be through a very open open source uh, of transparent. Okay, so, so you weren't literally meaning Google versus. Yeah. Or well, I, I mean, I, I mean, that saying? I would see that I would see Google as as hosting the computational power, and well, and then uh, and then and then sort of okay. inviting people. To now, come now I, all right. So, if you're talking about open source or open architecture, open architecture has many advantages if you're assembling things. The the question is, if you were producing, let's say, a car, let's say a Mercedes, so we don't use any US ones, all right? And someone buys the car from you, and they drive up down the block, and it stops. Brand new car. Do you think that if that person comes back and you tell them, oh, that was a BMW transmission that froze, or those were Pirelli tires that went flat, do you think 
your customer is going to be impressed. You're responsible. When you're responsible for the whole product to work as a product, not as a component part. If you're in the transmission business, you say, here's my transmission, go do what you want, assemble your own 1930s, you know, you buy the auto body one place. And, and maybe that's how we do it. There's certainly a lot of stuff done with open architecture. The disadvantage of that, and there's always a disadvantage to every good thing, is that nobody's taking responsibility. And if somebody is taking responsibility, of course you can outsource things. That's different. If you do outsourcing where you subcontract, where you're the general contractor and you take responsibility, of course. What you can't do is let somebody else assemble it and you're responsible for it. So if somebody puts what they think is a great asset or a great transmission in the car and you don't, but you're responsible for it, I don't think that's a viable model. So the answer is I think everything works the right tool for the right job. I have absolutely no problem with open architecture. I think this might be hard to do that way uh, because of the responsibility factor, particularly because of what this product is. This, you're, you're dealing with people's core retirement, millions of people, if you're successful. So that, that's why I would say that's an issue that I don't see so easily done that one. Time, yeah. Okay, we're done? Yes, well, you know, Thank you, the hearty souls who stayed here till the end. I really appreciate it. Now, I want to thank Bob for uh, wonderful comments and uh, great talk. And uh, thank all of you for coming. On behalf of Jim Paterba, Bob Solo, Economics Department, and the Sloan School, thank you all for being here. And we hope that you'll stay in touch with uh, the department and Sloan. And uh, thank you again for coming. Bye-bye. <laughs>